Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the man who put the Libya into Libya, Newton John. It's TV's Ian Lee. Ian, guys, I told you about showing up. Daisy, thank you for coming. I can't touch you. I can't touch you for legal reasons. Hello. Yes, the Libyans have finally been brought to trial, which means the end of sanctions. And once again, we're able to enjoy the delights of Libyan things. Hurrah! <laughs> and welcome to 11 O'Clock Show on Tuesday the 6th of April. Joining me to celebrate over a glass of Libyan sand, Daisy Donovan. <laughs> and live from Belgrade, please give a hand to our courageous reporter, Mackenzie Crook. Just for Daniel Ian. Every new day brings another new news day, and today is certainly no exception. So to find out what's going on, here's Tommy Vance and his news slam. Tuesday, April the 6th. And for ethnic Albanians, things take a turn for the worse. Claire Short arrives to entertain the crowds. Let's hope the ceasefire is accepted, or next week, it's the Grumbleweeds. <laughs> From a sour old brummy to a substitute mummy, and the government brings out a guide to good nannies. I remember I had a nanny once on the sofa while my son watched Trumpton. <laughs> From qualified nannies to the fruit of hen's fannies. And this puffin has created a super egg that's good for your heart. He spends his day wrapped in cling film, fiddling with chickens. It must be nice to get paid for your hobby. Now, back to Mission Control. Thank you, Tommy. But you know the news isn't just about the big headline stories. Oh, no, no, no. The smaller stories can be just exciting and amusing, as we're about to find out in our Red Top Roundup. Several people in the Philippines were crucified in an Easter ritual this weekend. They were painfully hammered to a cross with four-inch nails. Now, in Britain, we just give chocolate eggs away and have the day off. No fuss, nice and simple. You see, look, no holes in my hand, no blood when I write. Simple as that. <laughs> An Austrian sex doctor says that sex while standing up is the best cure for migraines. He says an orgasm whilst vertical reduces the flow of blood to the skull. So next time your girlfriend's got a headache, lads, I think you know what to do. <laughs> and finally, Pope John Paul's debut album of religious text, Abba Pater, topped the charts in five different countries this week. Fantastic idea. Obviously not commercial enough, though. He should have got someone in, like, Fat Boy Slim to do a dance remix. It goes on like, what you doing with it? What you doing with it? What you doing with it? Kiss my ring! <laughs> Up later in the show, Ali G literally tries to enter the upper classes when he hobnobs with Jacob Rees Mogg. Here's a clip. So, what if I knobbed the daughter of a lord? Um, yes, and what if you did? If she got a bun in the oven, what class would the little <laughs> nipper be? There are no winners in war except for the winners, and if the ceasefire comes to nothing, we might not see a result in this Balkan brouhaha until 2003. It may become the four-year war. This could cause immense problems. Over four years, the papers are going to run out of all those diagrams of planes and missiles and bombs and things. We've got a good one here of an Apache helicopter in the Express. From this, I can see that the pilot actually sits 48 centimetres above the co-pilot. Obviously, Quite irrelevant information for you and me, but for a Serbian sniper, that's the difference between a kneecap and an ear. So, <laughs> good work to the Express there for helping the war effort. But don't worry, should the war drag on, the papers have plenty of war diagrams up their sleeves, though they may become less detailed. Here's one of the C-55 Squaw, or Soldier's Torch. <laughs> As you can see, it's got an on-off switch. <laughs> that's pretty much it. The papers are also building up a psychological profile of Slobodan's right-hand man, the ruthless Arkan. He loves football, is married to a pop star, and has a sinister high-pitched voice, something like the bastard son of David Beckham and Joe Pasquale. <laughs> Maybe the most disturbing news comes from The Times. A report reveals that Serbia computer hackers are trying to tap into the British telephone network. Now just imagine what might happen if they got into BT. They could probably change our friends and family numbers. <laughs> Of course, that's a worst-case scenario. Please don't have nightmares. <laughs> the Mail today reveals that the marriage between the new People's Princess, Sophie Rhys-Jones, and... 
thingy bob is to be a people's <laughs> wedding. No one gives a tom tit about their pony wedding. <laughs> Sophie is not the people's princess. There is and has only ever been one real people's princess. Posh Spice. <laughs> Her forthcoming wedding to David Beckham is the true people's wedding because people will be able to read about it exclusively in OK magazine. Do the royals think they can compare with that? Well, we sent Ian on the streets to find out. So it looks like Sophie and Edward are being forced to invite 1,000 members of the great British public to their wedding. Unlucky. But just how will they go about selecting who gets in and who doesn't? I've come all the way to London to see if I can help them make their decision. It's about this story in the paper that Prince Edward and Sophie Rhys Jones are going to invite 1,000 ordinary people, just like you, to their wedding. Would you be interested in going? No. Interested? What? For the invite? Yeah. Yeah, I'll go. Wh who would you want to sit next to if you could go? Oh. Uh. You want to sit next to Sophie Rhys Jones? Yeah. Wouldn't you have to be Prince Edward to do that at, a, at the wedding? <laughs> no, I'll sit the other side of her. What would you buy them as a wedding present? <laughs> Nothing. 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 Even, not even a cheap toaster from the market. Well, I'm a pensioner and they're millionaires over <laughs> the bottom. You must be bleating joking. I attended a stag night. How, well, how much did you see? Well, there was the lot. Ch chuff and knockers. <laughs> Everything. And I thought, saw chuff and knockers. I thought, what she had for breakfast. So it appears that people aren't that bothered about being invited to the second most important wedding of the year. Maybe they'd be a bit keener if I disguise myself as a royal registrar. Yeah, like, you know. Excuse yeah. me, sir, sorry. From the Royal Registrar, would you be interested in going to Sophie Rhys Jones and Prince Edward's wedding? No, mate. Who's uh, wedding? Prince, Prince Edward and Sophie Rhys Jones are inviting a thousand members of the public. Would you be keen to. Did you invite me to the Royal Wedding? You, you, you have to go th I have to go through a couple of quick tests to make sure uh, you, you wouldn't. Of course, I'll see you later today. Pissing well, the well, Queen's well, face. Well, <laughs> 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 We've just been to one. Oh, really? Who's, who's is that? Uh, the vicar. <laughs> the vicar was getting married. His daughter. Oh, and did he marry? Did, his, did the vicar marry his daughter? Mm. Really? That's, dis that's disgusting. <laughs> There's a choice of people you can sit next to. Do any of these grab your attention? Mr. T, Rod Hull. He's dead. Sorry? He just died, didn't he? Shit. Um, all right, there'll be 1,001 <laughs> members of the British public there. Crikey. Could you make some snacks at all? Yeah, I think so. What snacks are you... What's your... your... Sausage rolls. Sausage rolls, fantastic. <laughs> are you only good at mini Kievs? Because Prince Edward loves good mini Kiev. <laughs> <laughs> OK. So there we have it. And judging by today's evidence, the problem facing Edward and Sophie isn't so much the selection of their guests, but actually finding a thousand people who can be asked to turn up. This has been Ian Lee, The 11 O'Clock Show, London. They cut out a whole gay thing there. They say the truth is the first casualty of war, but that's a lie. The first casualty was my two-week holiday in Dubrovnik that I booked. <laughs> now there are entire core of cowardly custard journos are scarped out of Kosovo. Who knows what's going on? Our frontline reporter, Mackenzie Crook, remains the last British voice in Belgrade. Hoping we can go live to him now. Are you there, Mackenzie? Hello, Mackenzie, are you there? Stravo, Ian, and hello from the studios of the Serbian Broadcasting Corporation. Mackenzie, what the hell are you doing on Serb TV? They won't let you talk about the refugee crisis there. <laughs> NATO lies, Ian. There are no problems in Kosovo. <laughs> Everyone is happy. Well, <laughs> what, what about what we've seen, Mackenzie? The, the queues of people stretching out for miles? Propaganda, Ian. When you see the truth, as we did on Serbian TV, it's easy to see why there were queues. Now, were these the pictures you saw? That's right, yeah, those ones. Exactly. You see, only half of the story, as usual. <laughs> Look at the real footage. As you can see, they were actually fans patiently waiting for a peaceful rock concert featuring popular singer-songwriter Nick Kershaw. <laughs> the burning of villages, Mackenzie. What can you tell me about that? <laughs> Friendly repairmen moving from village to village asking if anyone has any odd jobs that need doing. And then burning their houses down. And then burning their houses down, yes. That was the odd job most people requested. <laughs> One last thing, Mackenzie. Are the airstrikes having any effect over there? Airstrikes? What airstrikes? More evil, tri twisted propaganda from Clinton's lapdog Blair, I'm afraid. Haven't seen any evidence of airstrikes from my underground bunker. <laughs> Mackenzie, thank you. Despite your treachery, I do hope that one day after all this madness is done, we'll be able to meet again as friends, and then I can kill you. <laughs> Now, what have David Steele and Anne Widdicombe got in common? A big majority? A passion for Wagner? An intact hymen? No. <laughs> they both opened their hearts to me. I 
I'm Steele Standing, and who am I standing here with? Lord Steele. Thank you very much for talking to us today. People say everybody has to bring something to the party. What makes you come? I'm attracted <laughs> by the way that the party tries to protect the individual. Is it a case of A, B, D? What's missing? C. Do you? Yes. But is it one eye or two? One eye or two? Two. So is it try, 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 fail? No. It's try, try, maybe fail, try again, try, try. again, maybe fail, try again, succeed. <laughs> I went through about a hundred selection interviews before I got into this place. Life in Parliament seems like it goes at a million miles an hour. It does. And I mean, you must feel as though you're, you know, in an out of control car and suddenly think, my God, I've left terrible skid marks. <laughs> right, and now three, three o'clock this morning. Do you laugh and cry? Uh, I do vastly more laughing than I do crying, but what I What percent? Uh, oh, I laugh 95% <laughs> of the time. Um, well, I mean, I don't mean I go around laughing all the time. I mean, I'm normally I'm neither laughing nor crying, but I laugh more than I cry. If there's <laughs> blood on the carpet, are there tears on the dance floor? There are very rarely blood on the carpet, you know. Uh, there are tears on the dance floor. Of course there are tears on the dance floor, yes. But... In New Britain, you know, white-collar work seems to be replacing manual work. Do you, would you like to see more hand jobs being given? <laughs> I think you, can, you can't actually make jobs. A career can obviously be taken on many different paths, like you've just said when you came back from Africa. Do you ever think you've taken out the wrong end? No, I, kept, you know, I became a, uh, an MP by accident. I only got the nomination in my constituency because the previous candidate had resigned suddenly and there was an election coming up, so they had to take me. So you took it in the back door? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you, know, you have to work your way into the mind of your own party and penetrate the consciousness of the other parties. Do you feel you've achieved double penetration? <laughs> <laughs> I've tried to look into the minds of the other parties. Uh, I'll do my best. And in politics, you give heart, you give soul, you give head. Am I right? You're absolutely right. <laughs> you are a very cheeky young lady. You're monsoon bassoon monsoon. Thank you. Now, did you know that today is the first birthday of the government's New Deal scheme? Now, many of you will already be aware the 11 o'clock show is its own genuine New Deal boy, Daniel Dimitriou. So to celebrate, we've laid on a little bit of a treat for him. Dan, have you got a minute, mate? Come out here. Please to meet you. His last name's Dimitri. It sounds a bit like to meet you. It's a joke that may be wearing thin. Dan, <laughs> there you go. Uh, happy first New Deal birthday. Don't be afraid of the flame. Take it. Blow out the candles <laughs> and make a wish. Go on. <laughs> Did you wish for Nicky Campbell to become Mayor of London? <laughs> Might have. See you after the break. Ring the bell for Nicky Campbell. <laughs> Nicky Campbell for Mayor, sir. No, no, I think he's, I think he's a wanker myself. Look, you can't listen there, sir. Oh. <laughs> Nicky, can't move from there, then? He's a wanker. I do apologise, but he is. Pardon? No, he's an arse. <laughs> Welcome back to the second half. Still to come on tonight's show, Ali G performs a class turn, and we'll be talking to a computer expert. That's right, I'm back. I'm safe. What are you doing back here? I thought you loved it in Serbia, you turncoat. I did, until I found out they'd never even heard of Martin McCutcheon. A man has needs. Get out of here and sit down, <laughs> cheeky monkey. Time now to give you the answers to yesterday's quiz on ground force water features expert, Charlie Dimmock, who's been in all the papers this week. Question one, the answer was Leylandii can be planted at any time of the year, although do be careful about their locations, they can grow up to 20 feet tall. Didn't know that. Question two, 36B, or at least it would be if she wore one. <laughs> Question three, bit of a tricky, tricky one this, the answer wasn't, as many of you thought, her unquestionable gardening abilities, it was in fact her knockers. Although we would have accepted honkers, hooters, puppies, norks, chebs, boobies, bubbies, jugs, swingers, fun bumps, bongos, baps, or dairy pillows. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, question four. The answer is no, of course she doesn't. Not with either of them, and especially not with Titchmarsh. <laughs> and this week's winner is a Mr G Rosetsky. Congratulations, Mr Rosetsky. You win. Well, actually, no, you don't win, do you? Especially when the pressure's on. You're rubbish. <laughs>
Now, we've all been warned about Melissa, the computer bug that's transmitted through the internet, and the first ever virus that Mackenzie succeeded in picking up from a girl. <laughs> But what exactly is this porn pox? Well, who better to answer this than Stephen Hawking? Well, no one, but we've only got half an hour. So instead, <laughs> please welcome self-confessed former computer hacker, Robert Schifrin. <laughs> oh, yes. ah. uh. Now, Robert, you are, you're a computer consultant now, but you mm -hmm. were a genuine computer hacker, weren't you? I was. What was the most famous place you looked in via the computer? Prince Philip's account on the Prestel system. Oh, really? Mm. Now, a lot of people say computer experts, they're boring boffins, they're nerds, they haven't yeah. got girlfriends, they stink, they've got bad breath, God, they're <laughs> ugly and spotty, <laughs> keep away from me, I don't want to read your computer pornography. Yes. Are you like that? Um, <laughs> no, not anymore. Do you get an excitement when you're, you're hacking into someone's computer? Do you, do you, did you get the horn when you were tapping into Prince Philip? <laughs> Once I sort of managed to get as far as I wanted to get, then yeah. Now, we all, we all read about the Melissa virus, which mm -hmm. struck last week. Can you explain briefly what Melissa is and why it's caused so many problems? Um, you get it via the internet mm -hmm. if you're um, using the internet. Um, it sits on your computer, you don't know it's there. Right. You're beavering away, typing something in your word processor. Yep. It, suddenly, it suddenly looks through your address book right. and sends a copy of that document that you're working on to 50 people. Sneaky. Um, at random. And that's good? Um, it's not good if you're working on something secret or confidential and you suddenly find 50 strangers have got a copy of it. Like letters to your girlfriend or something? Absolutely. But or then resignation if, letters or If you're using a computer, you probably haven't got a girlfriend, have you? Is that...? Uh, true. <laughs> okay. Now, <laughs> you're, emailing, you're emailing some girl, though, obviously. Oh, yeah, you'll be emailing you some girl you don't in, meet in person. You in America. Email her. Probably just a 14-year-old boy, that's what I've always found out. <laughs> Still, uh, doesn't matter. Most, now, of, most of the 14-year-old boys are actually undercover cops, so be careful. I don't write to them if they are 14-year-old boys. <laughs> I write, no, you've misunderstood. I write to them if they're ladies with oh, feeling right. horny. Then you're safe. But they turn out they're boys when That's I've fine. met them. But, you know, we've got on fine. <laughs> now, the papers this week reported that the Serbians are trying to disrupt NATO's war effort mm -hmm. by hacking into their computers. Could this really affect the war? Because haven't they only yeah. got an old Spectrum and a VIC-20 that doesn't work? It's enough. Um, in, um, warfare nowadays is not just about sort of tanks and planes and stuff. It's also about guns. computers and guns. Guns. Um, computers, viruses, information, intelligence gathering and stuff. Right. And yes, there are intelligence people sort of planting viruses in computers, stuff like that. There are rumours of it going on in the Gulf War. I'm sure it's going on now. OK, that's, let me stop you there. What's the most money that's ever been stolen from a bank via computers? Millions of pounds. Um, but the thing is, if you go and steal $100 million or something, mm. then you'll get caught. Mm. If you steal 20 cents and you do it millions of times, mm. then you won't get caught. That's the way to do it. Now, now, listen, <laughs> the other day I was on the internet and uh -huh. I found a site that actually had no porn. Who do I complain to about that? <laughs> um, <laughs> there's a special information hotline you can complain to. Right. It's not good. Fantastic. Well, you're going to come around my house later on. We'll dig out my old BBC. We'll sort that Done. out. Ladies and gentlemen, Robert Schifrin. <laughs> Thanks, Robert. <laughs> Cheers. Ugly footballer Robbie Fowler is set to be fined £64,000 by the FA for pretending to snort coke after scoring against Everton at Anfield on Sunday. <laughs> this comes just weeks after allegedly taunting Graham Lasso by spreading his buttocks in an openly gay mime. <laughs> Robbie is obviously very distressed about the whole incident and has written a letter to the 11 o'clock show with an apology. Daisy's got a copy of it. Dear fans, hello, I am Robbie Fowler. I would like to apologise for misunderstandings which may have arisen from my recent actions on the football field. When I bent over and spread my bottom towards Graham Lasso, if you had looked closely, you would have seen that my buttocks were mouthing the words, I respect you, Graham, for your unquestionable straightness and uncompromisingly heterosexual lifestyle. <laughs> also, when I knelt down and snorted along the goal line, I was actually delivering an anti-drugs message. <laughs> and finally, just to warn you, Next Saturday, when I celebrate a goal by simulating sex with a 15-year-old girl, I'm simply expressing my horror at the activities of Graham Ricks. Thank you, love, Robbie. With Sophie and what's-his-name inviting the commoners to the royal wedding, is the class divider thing of the past? We sent Ali G, a man in a class of his own, to talk to Top Toff, the Honourable Jacob Rees-Mogg. Yeah, you don't stop. It goes out to the cool up top. That's it. Wicked. I is here with Lord Rhys Mogg, and we is talking about class. Lord Mogg is going to tell us how we all can be upper class, can't we? It was very kind of you to promote me to the uh, nobility, but of course I'm, I'm not. My, my father is, is Lord Rhys Mogg, and I'm just a commoner like everybody else. So what is class? What is class? Class is how other people uh, perceive individuals to be. 
Which class is Packies in? <laughs> Packies. By which? Which class? Is they in middle class, upper class? <laughs> You're saying Pakistan is living in, in, in England. Um, they're not in a class um, by nature of where they've come from. <laughs> what do you think makes a girl upper class? We're exactly the same thing that makes a man upper class. But is it things it's... like she spits into a hanky? <laughs> um, I don't think spitting into one's handkerchief is widely regarded as a symbol of membership of the upper class. What if uh, someone is so rich they have a swimming pool? Would they be <laughs> the upper class? Um, no, no, I think this is a bizarre definition of, right. of, of class. What if they had a swimming pool made of gold but filled with champagne and not the cheap stuff? <laughs> then would they be in the what upper if, class? What if, like Cleopatra, they bathed in ass's milk? Um, in what? Ass's milk. <laughs> um, ass milk? Butty milk? <laughs> ass's. From your... No, no, no. Uh, donkeys. Ah, all right. <laughs> so what if I knobbed the daughter of a lord? Um... Yes. And what if you did? If she got a bun in the oven, what class would the little nipper be? Um, it would so much depend on the circumstances, depend on the girl in question and so on and so forth. So what if you got busy with my sister? <laughs> you would advise it because she ain't the cleanest girl out I there. I haven't had the pleasure of meeting my sister. I, well, it can be arranged. She'll be keen. I, I, I've been speculating on, on my ha ha having a relationship with somebody I've never met and that right. leading to a child being born and then as to what class it might be is so uh, far-fetched um, as, as to be ridiculous. I have no idea uh, What, you think this. you was too good for my sister? I certainly not. <laughs> right. like, you is. No, no. I'm, no, you is, though. I'm, she's rank. She's nothing. I'm <laughs> no, um, believe me. Um, Even my mum cussed her to tell her she's a slut. <laughs> Would I be upper class if I got a top hat and wore it? Um, well, would you like to try? I have a top hat. I can lend it to you for the next few minutes of this interview, if you'd like. So am I upper class now? Absolutely. You're a dead ringer for Lord Snooty. Thank you, Jacob Rees Smog. You have shown that class is interesting and we should know about it, but not get stuck in it. If we's gonna get a head, wicked. Thank you very much. Keep it real, Jacob. Thank you. I and I. Bye. And come and visit us at the yeah. Stains Massive. It's a pleasure. <laughs>And that's the end of the show. Just time to give you the chance to win a signed copy of Perfect Moment, the debut single by Martine McCutcheon. <laughs> to win, just answer this simple question. In EastEnders, Martin's character Tiffany was married to the landlord of the Queen Vic. The question is, is that a good enough reason to put up with this crap? If you think you know the answer, please uh, send it on a postcard to Stefan Dennis. <laughs> <laughs> the 11 o'clock show, P.O. Box 30002, London SE1, 8WW. Good night. Good, good night. night.